seats. We want to remind everyone of a few safety and housekeeping announcements this morning. Again, in the event of an emergency, please remain calm, walk, do not run to the nearest exit. Emergency exits are located at the front and rear of the hall. Please look around you and note the locations of the exits nearest you, as it may be different than the area that you enter the room. Smoking is not permitted inside any of the university buildings. This program is being webcast. To maintain the quality of the feed, we need to limit movement in the room. If you need to exit during the program, you will be directed to do so in the back of the room on the third floor level. If you haven't already done so, please silence all cell phones now. Food and drink are not permitted inside Soma Hall. And we want to thank you for your attention and cooperation. We will begin in just a moment. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Vernick, and I am the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research, and I want to welcome you back to day two of our Gun Policy Summit here. I think I can speak for everyone when I say that uh, the first day was um, a wonderfully exciting and informative event and also really an energizing one when we were able to hear from so many speakers about what we know about how to, to reduce this pressing problem of gun violence in the United States. We will be shifting gears slightly today and beginning with a panel of experts who come from countries other than the United States. And if you think that you've come a long way to attend the summit, and if you have, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, I think we got you beat today. Um, we have folks who very kindly have made the trip here from New Zealand, from Australia, and from Scotland, who are just the experts in how their countries have responded both to the general problem of gun violence but also to certain specific high-profile um, mass shootings. And our goal in presenting this information is both to understand what the effects of those responses to the mass shootings in those countries were, but also to learn lessons from how those countries responded, how they were able to to make important, meaningful policy change and what we might um, learn in this country from those experiences. After that morning panel, we'll also hear from uh, experts on uh, the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution who will speak about how the various strategies that uh, we've been discussing over the last two days fit within uh, the U.S. Supreme Court's evolving jurisprudence about the Second Amendment, and then very importantly for any effort to, to make policy change, we'll be um, presenting the very first results from a brand new public opinion poll that, uh, that we commissioned and developed and that has some very exciting and I would say also very, very relevant findings. The program today you see will end at about 12.30 or perhaps um, slightly earlier um, and we'll at that time thank the audience very much for its attendance. Um, the, uh, the experts at that time, including both all of the speakers and the co-authors of the various papers, will be invited um, to convene um, in a closed session this afternoon to develop recommendations that, uh, that we hope can form a sort of consensus that, that we'll be delivering to policymakers, opinion leaders, um, community members, the public, the media, and, and others. Recommendations that, that we hope um, 
can form a comprehensive approach to addressing this problem and that are based on the, the evidence, lessons, and experiences that we've heard today. Those recommendations will um, also be included in the book that is being published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. The press has asked me to remind you that um, we have a special summit price for the book of eight dollars. Um, if you um, uh, visit the press table in the second floor lobby, there's information about how to order the book, and we're expecting the book, very excitingly, uh, to also be available at major retailers nationwide. We're, we're so grateful to the Hopkins Press for helping us to produce this, this book, a real um, memorial of this, of this summit in such short order, precisely so that it can serve as a record and a resource for the policymakers who are going forward to try to make change. Okay, well, without um, more being said, I think we will shift now to our international case studies of responses to gun violence, and I'll just very briefly introduce um, each speaker in turn. So our first speaker is Dr. Mick North. Um, he'll be speaking about how, um, how the uh, United Kingdom, Scotland, the United Kingdom, etc., responded after the Dunblane shooting. And Dr. North has a very special perspective as he uh, is a parent of uh, one of those children involved in that shooting. So thank you, Dr. North. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I make no apologies for including my first slides. They don't show data or policy proposals, but they're a reminder of why all of us in whatever country we live should be striving to reduce gun violence. They show a class of five and six year olds, including my daughter Sophie. Within weeks of this photo being taken in January 1996, half of that group of children were dead. And another iconic photo of them appeared in the media around the world. Many of you may well be familiar with this. The shorthand for what happened to them is the name of the Scottish town where they lived and died, Dunblane. And my talk will be a narrative of what happened in Dunblane and how it led to significant changes in Britain's gun laws. I'll not be able to provide much detail or analysis, but hope that the outline that I give will give you an idea of what we achieved in Britain following such a tragic event. On the morning of the 13th of March, 1996, Thomas Hamilton, a man with a grudge against the community, walked into Dunblane Primary School carrying four handguns and over 700 rounds of ammunition. He went to the gym and immediately opened fire on, a cl on the class that was, uh, had just gathered there. Within three minutes, he had fatally injured one teacher and 16 children, three other teachers and 10 children were injured. He then shot himself. Britain had relatively strict gun laws, but it was still easy to own a handgun. An owner simply had to provide a good reason for owning each and every weapon. And for most, the good reason was target shooting at an approved gun club. Handguns were not permitted for self-defense. And I should add, there is no equivalent of Second Amendment rights in the UK. But Thomas Hamilton was a licensed gun owner who had been permitted to own all his handguns and ammunition for the purpose of target shooting. He'd held his firearms license for 20 years. There had been concerns about him, but the police had never attempted to revoke his firearms license. Dunblane was not the first incident in which a handgun had been used in Britain to kill a large number of people. In 1987, in the town of Hungerford, another legal gun owner had killed 16 people 
half with a semi-automatic rifle and half with a handgun. The conservative government of the time subsequently banned semi-automatic rifles but made no changes to controls over handguns, probably as a result of pressure from the gun lobby with whom the conservatives had traditional links. In the eight and a half years between Hungerford and Dunblane, there had been a rise in gun crime which had led to a, a <clears throat> concern, and particularly uh, the use of handguns. There was a lot of speculation about the provenance of these weapons and the numbers of illegal handguns in circulation. These uh, <clears throat> calculations were often made by gun enthusiasts to highlight their view that it was only illegal guns that were used in crime. But at the same time as this was happening in the early 1990s, there were also concerns about increased popularity of uh, <clears throat> the use of hang uh, powerful handguns for target shooting and the e evolution of combat shooting events to justify ownership of high caliber guns. Some in the traditional shooting fraternity were in fact concerned that this gave shooting the wrong image. It was against this background that the shootings at Dunblane occurred. The slaughter of primary school children so horrified the nation that there was an immediate call for something to be done. And the government responded by setting up a public inquiry chaired by a senior judge. One effect of this was to de delay government policy decisions until the report appeared. But it also prevented those of us who were directly involved speaking out immediately. We had to wait until the hearings of the public inquiry were over. It did give us time to collect our thoughts and it also helped uh, <clears throat> us to say that we were not making an immediate knee-jerk emotional response. Lord Cullen uh, took evidence from a variety of individuals and organisations, uh, both written submissions and at public hearings. And inevitably, firearms ownership was one of the major issues that he investigated. However, whilst this was going on, the public were not waiting. There were, <clears throat> immediately after the shootings, campaigns uh, was, were started uh, aimed at getting tighter gun laws. They were motivated by the risk to minimise, uh, sorry, motivated by the wish to minimise the risk of another Dunblane uh, occurring, another mass shooting. The idea that somebody had been allowed by the state to be armed uh, so heavily was a shock in a country where gun ownership uh, remains low. Campaigners concluded that the best way to minimise that risk was to restrict access to the guns, and this view hardened into calling for an outright ban on handguns. Why handguns? Handguns have been used in Dunblane, they've been used in Hungerford, and were viewed as especially dangerous, concealable, rapidly fired, multi-shot. Their only use was for target shooting, and this did not justify the risks. Sportsmen had other alternatives. There was also the view, especially when the public were reminded of Hungerford, that the balance between uh, <clears throat> the shooter's wishes and public safety had gone, uh, was wrong, that that balance had to be restored. At the time, there were no there was no gun control movement and very little widely available research into gun violence in Britain. So the reaction was spontaneous. It involved the setting up of a number of different activities and organisations, initially somewhat independent of one another. These included petitions. This was the pre-internet age. 
So the petitions were physically signed by people. Two in particular gained a massive support. One by a Scottish tabloid newspaper, the Sunday Mail, which gained over 400,000 signatures. And the Snowdrop petition, started by a group of, uh, of people in central Scotland, uh, uh, <clears throat> some of whom knew the families, which uh, in the end gained over 700,000 signatures, all calling for a ban on handguns. There were other media campaigns. Most of the news national newspapers in Britain came out in support of much tighter control on guns. And there was also the founding of a gun control organization, Gun Control Network. Uh, I was one of the founding members of that. And we were concerned that once the initial campaigns for uh, handguns uh, <clears throat> were over, there needed to be some long-term strategy uh, for gun control in Britain, and that we wanted to encourage more research to be undertaken. The families themselves became involved at different times in the campaigns, uh, each uh, family making its own decision. There was no collective decision uh, to take part in the campaigns, but everyone in the end, everyone who had lost a child or had had a child injured, uh, uh, supported the aims of the, of, of the campaigns. And as it, we were aware that public opinion was so much in favour of a handgun ban, the main aim was to keep the issue alive, to put pressure on politicians through lobbying, through media work. Many of us had to sacrifice um, some personal privacy to supply the media with stories to keep the issue alive. But it was a price we were prepared to pay to ensure uh, that the, the issue uh, <clears throat> uh, kept going. And as uh, families of the victims, we also found we could get access to the most senior politicians, including the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. Needless to say, there was fierce opposition for the things the campaigners were proposing from the gun lobby, who basically wanted no changes. Unnecessary because they considered the shooting to be the work of one, uh, uh, were a one-off uh, <clears throat> carried out by a madman. And in some ways it felt like we were being told that this was the price you had to pay for their right to keep their guns. I'll not go through all the other things that they said uh, to support their case, uh, because I think you're probably familiar with them on this side of the Atlantic as well. So what happened? Well, eventually, when Lord Cullen uh, made his, uh, <clears throat> published his report, he recommended tighter controls over handguns, but didn't recommend an outright ban, saying that disablement uh, uh, various disablement mechanisms should be, should be uh, introduced. But he too had been frustrated by an intransigence uh, in, in the gun lobby views that nothing could be changed. And so he went on to say that if the systems of disablement were not adopted, then a ban should be considered. The government was weak and unpopular at the time and facing a general election and found itself caught between the very strong public mood articulated by the campaigns and uh, what the uh, gun lobby, who were, uh, with whom they had traditional links, wanted. And they opted for a compromise. They proposed a ban on uh, high-caliber handguns. not without difficulty because they were opposed from both sides in Parliament by those who wanted a, a, an outright ban on handguns and those who wanted no change at all, but they had sufficient support in Parliament to pass the Firearms Amendment Act uh, <clears throat> 11 months after the Dunblane shootings, which did prohibit high-calibre handguns. Later on in 1997, uh, <clears throat> the Labour Party was elected. In opposition, they had promised uh, to ban small-caliber handguns as well, to complete the, the total 
prohibition of handguns. And as I say, they were elected in May 1997, and one of their first announcements was to, uh, to say that they were going to introduce a bill to prohibit all remaining handguns. And subsequently, the second Firearms Amendment Act of that year was passed six months uh, after the election. The net result of that was that within two years of Dunblane, handguns had become prohibited weapons in Great Britain, and uh, all handgun owners uh, were asked to surrender their weapons and were compensated. I now want to say a little bit about the impact, but I do have to qualify this. I am not a criminologist, and it would be difficult for me to give an, an objective assessment of what happened. But I can make one or two points. The gun lobby had always set the bar extremely high. It was in their interest to do so by saying that the gun ban would not work if there wasn't an immediate fall in gun crime, if, there was, uh, uh, if, if hang murders with handguns still considered. But it was <clears throat> inevitable that it would take time for a ban on the legal ownership of, uh, of handguns to work through to a pool of illegal handguns that were out there and were involved in crime. And initially, in England and Wales, the rise in gun crime that had been happening during the early 1990s did continue. But it peaked in 2003, 2004, since when there has been a significant fall in firearms offences in every subsequent year. In Scotland, the position was different. There have been a drop in gun crime ever since 1998, uh, uh, and it's now at one-third of the level it was in 1996. NABIS, uh, the National uh, Ballistics uh, Information Service, set up uh, since Dunblane, reports that there are now less guns on the street in Britain. And I've just included a couple of figures because I find them quite striking. I know taking individual figures like this uh, is, is dangerous. However, I looked up um, the gun incidents from last year that were being reported in the press and looked at the gun homicide rates. In Great Britain last year, there were 32 reported gun homicides. And I was struck when Mayor Bloomberg was talking yesterday morning that he mentioned the figure of 33. 33 gun homicides in the US every day. In London, a city of 8 million people, there were just six gun homicides last year. This is not a country where gun violence is increasing, as I suspect you may have heard from some gun lobbyists on this side of the Atlantic. I'll skip over the next one. And just to say that I believe there have been a number of legacies, as I've <coughs> obviously tighter controls over firearms. And as I mentioned, Britain remains a country with a low level of gun violence. But another legacy of Dunblane is that there has been a more balanced discussion of gun policy. Gun control advocates are listened to by politicians, have an input into possible changes uh, in further gun laws. They don't have an exclusive access, but they have an equal access with those who want to use guns for shooting. Those of us who lost children at Dunblane were deeply shocked by the shootings at Sandy Hook. The parallels have been too horrific uh, to contemplate at times. And I know what we did in Great Britain is not a solution that would, would necessarily work in the United States. But what I hope you take from this is that after a tragic event like uh, <clears throat> Dunblane or Sandy Hook, it is, it is important to keep the issue alive, keep pressure on those who make ch uh, legislative changes, and keep reminding them of what, it really, what really happened. It cannot be dismissed in a single name. Real lives lost. I 
I wish you strength and I wish you success in improving the gun laws in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. North. Uh, before I introduce the next speaker, I would just like to recognize again uh, Johns Hopkins University President Ron Daniels, who's joined us today, and to, to thank him very, very sincerely for his just unstinting, unflagging support, leadership, vision for yesterday and today. Uh, and that support is recognized in large ways and maybe in somewhat smaller ways. The, you can only imagine the enormously busy schedule of a university president, and yet President Daniels is here again for the second day of uh, today's event. So thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Rebecca Peters. Um, Rebecca is the former director of the International Action Network for Small Arms, or IANSA, one of the most effective um, international gun violence prevention organizations. She'll be talking about a tragic shooting that occurred in Australia uh, in a place called Port Arthur. And at that time, I think, although she may not um, wanted to take the credit. I think the world gives Rebecca the lion's share of the credit for leading the effort to, um, to encourage the politicians in Australia to swiftly and importantly take action. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Thanks, Jan, and um, thanks to the university and to everyone for coming. Um, Australians uh, know something of what Americans are feeling now because we had, in, uh, in 1996, the, what was at the time the world's largest um, mass shooting by a single shooter in a single place, and that was, as Jan said, at Port Arthur in Tasmania, 28th of April, 96. And 35 people were killed, 19 were injured. It was a public place, a tourist location. And most of the people who were killed were um, on, on holiday from other parts of Australia. And it was um, um, the, the gun that was involved, two, two assault weapons were involved, and they were guns that were banned in other states but available legally in Tasmania, the, um, the, the state where it occurred. And... The, it, was, it was so shocking for our country. Uh, 35 homicides in one day was um, about one third to half of the total number of gun homicides we normally had in a year in the whole country. Um, and, uh, and, and also it had been preceded by, um, we'd had previous mass shootings and a lot of discussion about the gun laws and um, it was the combination of factors was uh, there was just a huge public demand for change and the our prime minister uh, showed extraordinary leadership and he convened the state governments um, and said we've got to sort this out and got an agreement within uh, less than two weeks of the massacre there was an agreement to change the gun laws it was called the national firearms agreement um, and at the time in australia the gun laws, we have eight states and territories in Australia, the gun laws varied between, enormously between the states, something like uh, is the case here, where um, guns that were banned in some states were available in other states. Also, the standard of licensing varied enormously so that a person whose um, background would disqualify them from owning a gun in one state could qualify to own guns in a different state. And... Um, we, the, the one consistent thing we had was that across all jurisdictions we had quite strict regulation of handguns. And we'd had a series of mass shootings 
Um, about once a year, there was a mass shooting, um, often involving family members. And each time there was discussion in the media, what should we do about guns? And each time our politicians tended to prevaricate, mainly. Um, and there was a, um, uh, a campaign based on information. We wanted to, there was a campaign which I led, what was, the organization was called the National Coalition for Gun Control, which was campaigning for laws based on the type of, of gun violence that we had. And the type of gun violence we had in Australia was, we had uh, evidence that showed uh, most gun deaths were suicides, as is the case in most industrialized countries. Um, and among homicides, the largest category of homicide was among people who knew each other. And among those, the largest category was domestic homicide. And um, the, that most homicide perpetrators had not previously been convicted of a violent offense or and they hadn't previously been adjudicated mentally ill. And there wasn't, therefore, and, and what that told us was we needed a system of gun control that did not wait until an official record was made that there was a problem. Because if you waited until after the fact, that was uh, too late. Um, the evidence also showed us that uh, many homicides were committed with guns that had been legally obtained, either by the person who perpetrated the homicide or by the previous owner. Um, and that was not surprising because guns were quite easily available. Um, and so, and I suppose what I, uh, what I think about the, the situation in many American states is that the distinction between legal and illegal isn't necessarily that significant. If it's so, if it's so easy to, if there's so little requirement to be a legal gun owner, um, then the, the difference between legal and illegal doesn't, isn't, there's not such a big difference. Um, and we had, um, the, we'd had uh, several inquiries into what the gun laws should be in Australia. The most prominent, most important one was the National Committee on Violence, which had been established after a mass shootings, two mass shootings in 1987. And that was a, um, a committee that had made 20 recommendations about um, what the gun laws, about reforms to the gun laws. The most important was that, well, the fundamental ones that gun laws needed to be uniform across the country. It, the, per, the point of uniformity is important because, um, not only because guns um, move between states, but also people move between states. You know, the, most of the people who were killed at Port Arthur came from states where the la gun laws were stricter, uh, including the largest group of victims came from Victoria, the state which had arguably the strongest gun laws in the country. And, um, and that's what we do, we go on holidays. Um, we shouldn't put ourselves in more danger by traveling to a different part of our own country. Um, and the recommendations of the National Committee on Violence were included in the end in the National Firearms Agreement. There also had been a series of other inquiries, especially inquiries on uh, domestic violence and inquiries on crime, criminal justice reform. There had been a whole series of them and mostly they hadn't been acted on. But what happened after Port Arthur was that the National Committee on Violence recommendations were pulled off the shelf and um, turned into law. And so that's a hopeful, um, that gives hope to all of us who are involved in research and who think no, no one's taking any notice of this. Um, so we had a coalition of hundreds of organizations which were uh, public health and medical organizations, women's groups, welfare workers, senior citizens associations, mental health counselors, youth organizations, uh, parents groups, legal services, human rights groups, Churches, researchers, trade unions were part of the uh, National Coalition for Gun Control. It was a very broad coalition, and the groups in it had different reasons for being concerned about the easy availability of guns. They didn't, they, you know, the groups concerned about suicide maybe were coming from a different angle from the groups concerned about homicide, but fundamentally they saw that the easy availability of guns was, um, and especially of, of um, rapid fire of semi-automatic weapons was contributing to the problems of health and justice that they were seeking to address. And it was important also to establish that, that this was a mainstream concern. Very often the um, argument about firearm regulation is uh, framed in the media as a tug of war between uh, 
people who want to ban all guns and, you know, who are dedicated to that topic and people who want any guns to be available who are dedicated to that topic. And the importance of a broad coalition was to uh, show that this was not just an argument between two specialist lobby groups. Um, Australia also has a strong gun lobby and which had traditionally uh, held the political parties uh, hostage by threatening to uh, campaign against them in, in marginal seats when an election was held, which is similar to what happens in other countries too. And although surveys showed that most gun owners themselves were not opposed to stronger laws, the gun lobby, the official gun lobby, took this very hard line extremist position and had uh, prevailed because although we in the, in the coalition tried to persuade both sides of the two major political parties that if they acted together, it would be okay. The very adversarial nature of Australian politics was such that uh, we hadn't been able to get any movement for years. Um, but once this um, massacre occurred, there was a huge, um, just the, the public reaction and the media reaction was so strong that finally um, the politicians took action. And the breakthrough came because our Prime Minister, who showed extraordinary personal courage, it was a very frightening time, but uh, also the, the, it was a little bit the perfect storm, as someone said yesterday, because he had just been elected, so he had some time ahead of him before he needed to worry about another election. And also, he was the leader of the Conservative Party, of our two major parties. And it uh, and, and his party was traditionally considered the more likely ally of the gun lobby, but it also meant that his party was in a better position to broker a bipartisan agreement. It was more likely that a conservative inviting progressives to come on board would succeed than progressives inviting conservatives to come on board. And what we talked about it a bit as the Nixon goes to China um, effect. Um, and so he got an agreement between all the state and territory governments. I, I don't know if I said that gun laws in Australia are state and territory laws, and so the, the, the federal government doesn't have the power to make gun laws, but so it was his convening and his political power that he used to get this agreement. Um, and then once the bipartisan agreement was there, then at state and federal and territory level, the, uh, that gave political cover to the parties. Um, and although that was a great um, that was a great defeat for the gun lobby, but they were continued it to be very angry about it and had a big campaign of misinformation. There were leaflets in rural communities saying the government is banning all guns, and it was it was quite a frightening time. One of the the memories that many of us have from that time was an image in the media of the prime minister addressing a public gathering of um, uh, l largely consisting of gun owners, and it was clear uh, in the in the pictures that he was wearing a bulletproof vest under his suit, which was the first time ever in Australia that that had happened. That anyone knew of, and it sort of highlighted how crazy the situation was that our political leaders should be concerned for their life when addressing a public gathering. Um, so what was the, um, the, what were the laws? Based on the recommendations of the National Committee on Violence, most of the recommendations were incorporated. Uh, one recommendation which was not incorporated in the new laws was the NCV had recommended that uh, handguns should be required to be stored at pistol clubs. So that wasn't uh, taken into account, but most of the others were. So we have the, primarily the, the uh, ban on semi-automatic rifles and shotguns and on high-capacity magazines. Those were bought back for approximately retail price plus a bit. Um, and there was a giant gun destruction um, of those guns. Uh, registration of all guns um, and, and raising the standard of licensing for guns so that it became more difficult to qualify and especially the evidentiary standard was, um, was changed. It used to be that things you, you said on the application about whether you qualified to own a gun, you could just say them and now you had to prove them. Um, a waiting period of 28 days, which um, in the opinion of Australian police and researchers is particularly important, not only because it allows time for background checks and also it allows um, uh, for people whose 
thoughts are disorganized or whose lives are a bit of a mess, they, um, they may change their mind or they may just not come back to, to, to finish the process. So the waiting period is one of the most important elements of our laws. Um, there's discretion to refuse. There's a list of reasons why licenses can be refused or cancelled, but also there's discretion to refuse or cancel a license if it's not in the public interest, and also to put conditions on it. So, uh, for example, if um, um, if a person uh, lives in a house, if, if a gun owner lives in a house with someone who has, who themselves would not be. Uh, would not qualify to own guns due to their criminal record or their mental health condition or something like that, then that the gun owner's license can have put conditions put on it, such as you have to store your gun somewhere else, or you have to have, you, have, you, you can't have as many guns, or some, some other kind of, just recognizing that people's living situations uh, vary. And so that's an important measure in the laws, the capacity to not just cancel, but things can be suspended or conditions or adjusted. Um, and all of that depends on inquiries being made by the local police. Uh, there's a requirement for references, things like that. Uh, there's a permit. You have to apply for a permit to acquire each weapon, and it becomes more difficult to acquire additional weapons. If you already have a gun suitable for the purpose that you claim, then it becomes more difficult to justify a second or third gun. Uh, there are safe storage requirements. Ammunition, you can only buy ammunition for, for the gun for which you have a license. And there's a ban on private sales, so all gun sales have to go through a dealer. Um, so those were the, uh, and we had a big uh, buyback, which um, my colleague Philip Albers will talk about the buyback. Basically, um, about at that time, about 700,000 guns were destroyed. Um, the results of the, oh, and in addition, there was a um, um, money for uh, upgrading and linking together the police uh, computer systems because across the country there, we had a problem of lack of connection between state police and also lack of connection between the state and the federal. And so upgrading of the, of the police computers was a, an important um, part of the, of the agreement. And there was a big information and public awareness campaign, which um, I think was actually quite important in getting the result that we eventually got. The result is that we have seen now, 16 years later, um, gun violence is at levels that are about 50% uh, what they were before. So at the beginning, we had uh, rates of gun violence about 2.7 per 100,000 was, was firearm mortality. So that was about a quarter of the US rate. Now we're at about a tenth of the US rate. Um, and homicides, overall homicides have decreased uh, really substantially and we've seen a reduction basically in all areas of gun violence and we've not had a mass shooting since that time which was interesting because we'd had them about once a year before. Uh, and the, the, so that's a very spectacular good result for Australia but nonetheless, the American gun lobby has been keen to provide information to, to misinform American gun owners about the consequences of uh, strengthening gun laws in Australia. They produced a video, which I think the video, you can find it on the internet, it's, I don't know what, it, it's, it's basically saying, look what a terrible thing uh, gun law reform is. And the video says that Australian citizens are cowering behind locked doors. They're at the mercy of criminals. Gun murders have increased massively as a result of the gun law reforms. And um, this video was so outrageously false that our attorney general took the unusual step of writing a letter to Charlton Heston, uh, who was then uh, leader of the, the NRA, um, asking the NRA to uh, stop using this, this video and saying uh, there are many things that Australia can learn from the United States. How to manage firearm ownership is not one of them. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know if that, I think that's quite unusual for the Attorney General of a country to write to a movie star uh, requesting a policy <laughs> ch uh, statement changes. Anyway, uh, apparently the NRA has not heeded the request of our government because that video is still going around on the internet. Um, and 
I wanted to finish by just mentioning what one Australian member of parliament said to me about, because that was, was, it was sat very satisfying for them to be able to finally make these changes. He said, you know, we go into public life to try to make things better and then politics gets in the way. So it's good to have the chance to do what is right without having to worry about the politics. And I, I, I hope that some kind of bipartisan um, uh, solution can be found for the US as well um, and enable uh, policies to be based on what actually will save lives rather than, um, rather than anything to do with money or, or, or politics. Thanks. Well, thank you, Rebecca, very much. Um, and as both uh, Rebecca and Dr. North have alluded to, there, there is unfortunately a fair amount <clears throat> of misinformation that is both floating around and very, very um, strongly asserted by, uh, by some of those who want to dismiss the successes that we've seen in Great Britain and in Australia and elsewhere. And so we're very fortunate today to have Philip Alpers here to, um, to dispel some of that misinformation, some of those uh, myths. Uh, Philip is with the Sydney School of Public Health, and many of us also rely upon uh, the gun policy network that he um, helps to run that pushes information to our computers every day about gun violence activities around the world. So thank you very much, Dr. Alpers. Well, I'll be dealing with a little bit of misinformation here as well. Uh, for example, in, in recent years, as, as you're hearing now, several democracies have dramatically reduced the availability of firearms to private individuals. And I emphasize the word democracies because contrary to the internet chatter, uh, the countries in which voters have supported gun amnesties and buybacks are not dictatorships. They're countries like the United States who consider themselves to be as we do, as free as you are. They include the United Kingdom, Brazil, Argentina, and Australia, which in recent years destroyed a third of its privately owned guns. Many observers continue to cite the official tally of guns destroyed by smelting in the Australian National Firearms Buyback as around 650,000 newly prohibited weapons. Yet the actual number of private weapons destroyed is now estimated at well over a million. You, you just heard from Rebecca Peters in how in the wake of the Port Arthur massacre, all Australian states and territories very quickly agreed to new uniform legislation, the primary declared purpose of which was to reduce the risk of mass shootings. Owner licensing was tightened to require proof of genuine reason. If you had a, lived in a city suburb and had a, a, deer sto uh, a deer stalking rifle with a telescopic sight, you had to establish that you had uh, access to, or p written permission to get onto property uh, where you could shoot safely, and that there was actually some deer there. And uh, so these, these are not invariable, these, these, uh, these uh, questions asked by police and settled with police are not invariable, some people would get away with it, but most, the, the standard of proof was raised. And um, you had to, to establish a genuine reason and give proof of that genuine reason. So, um, the, uh, to, to possess a gun, uh, the, the sale and transfer of firearms was limited to licensed dealers, rapid fire rifles and shotguns were banned and they were bought back and destroyed, and remaining firearms were registered to uniform national standards. The big headlines were generated by two nationwide, federally funded gun buybacks. But until now, the number of additional and voluntary and unrecompensed surrenders for destruction remained unquantified. It's sometimes forgotten that Port Arthur was not Australia's introduction to mass shootings. In the seven years to January 1988, that is well before Port Arthur, 
six gun massacres, and by that I mean five or more victims shot dead in proximate events, not counting the perpetrator, had already claimed 40 lives. Australians were appalled, and first the states and territories began running their own amnesties, and then came three federal interventions. The, uh, according to articles in print media published during the past, uh, during the 24 years which followed, we know that 38 states, territory and federal firearm amnesties ran from a, m a minimum combined total of 3,062 weeks. The actual sum is higher than that because some of them were open-ended and some of them simply didn't report. In the 1996 to 97 national firearms buyback of rapid fire long guns, and then in the 2003 national handgun buyback which followed, Australians gave up for destruction 728,667 newly prohibited firearms in return for market value compensation. Then in recent weeks, when we measured the scale of the Australian experiment before coming to this, uh, this summit with a bit more accuracy, we found that at least 219,721 additional firearms were surrendered for destruction. That's a number which until now has been untallied and largely unrecognised. From the reports of amnesties in which numbers were published, a total of 948,000 firearms were surrendered to police for destruction. So although the Australian buyback, the Australian initiative was most often described as a buyback, in which gun owners received cash compensation, it's important to note that of all the weapons handed in for destruction since 1988, close to one in four yielded no financial return to its owner. Such was the swing in public opinion. Large numbers of gun owners sent lawfully held firearms to the smelter, even when there was no obligation to do so. This tally of just under a million weapons destroyed is conservative. In published reports of 20 gun amnesties, we found no count of firearms collected, and so we were unable to include the numbers handed in for destruction. In addition, many firearms seized by police and destroyed, for example, by court order, are not included in, in, in amnesty totals. On the other hand, two small so-called weapon amnesties included non-firearms in their published totals without separation. So taking into account these uncertainties, it seems certain, it does seem certain, that Australia collected and destroyed well over a million firearms. That is between five and six firearms per hundred people. A commonly accepted estimate of the number of firearms in Australia at the time of Port Arthur is 3.2 million. This suggests that post-massacre destruction efforts reduced the national stock of firearms by one third. If we accept a frequently cited estimate of 270 million privately owned guns in the United States, a similar effort in this country would require the destruction of 90 million firearms. Now this is not to suggest for a moment that such a massive reduction in the national stockpile could be effected in the United States because no two, no two jurisdictions share the same problems, legislative or social settings, let alone attitudes. So none can claim to have discovered the, national, the, the magic bullet. And now the Australian experience also suggests that a reduction in the availability of firearms might only be temporary. It's important to say here that Australia no longer has a firearm manufacturing industry. Gun dealers source their stock from overseas, mainly from the United States. And this allows us to clearly link This allows us to clearly show that the removal, my apologies, my website is a bit slow today, here we go, um, it clearly show that uh, the removal of several types of newly banned firearm, firearms was followed by a surge of replacement buying. Now in the year of the main Australian buyback, that is the 96 to 97 financial year, which you can see around about there. Uh, firearm imports briefly doubled as owners replaced their banned, surrendered, multi-shot rifles and shotguns with new single-shot replacements. But in the two years which followed, annual gun imports crashed 
capture just 20% of that 96-97 peak. And for two years, the trade remained stagnant, but then it began to recover. By mid-2012, following a steady 10-year upward trend in gun buying, Australians had restocked the national arsenal of private guns to pre-Port Arthur levels. They did this by importing 1,055,000 firearms, an average of nearly 44,000 each year since destruction programs began. And I emphasize here that I have not taken into account uh, the, uh, the population increase, and so this is simply the number of guns, not the per capita rate. To this should be added the national stock of illicit firearms, which by definition cannot be counted. Although claims of large-scale gun smuggling to Australia are very common, almost all such stories are evidence-free. For example, a seizure of Glock pistols by New South Wales Police in March of last year provided the first published evidence of a sizeable batch of smuggled guns coming into Australia since the 1980s. Instead, it's what they call over the Mexico and Canadian borders the ant trade. One gun here, two guns there, uh, three guns here. So where do our crime guns come, um, come from? Well, a recent study from the Australian Institute of Criminology, which was recounting a cross-governmental effort, all the agencies involved, to trace firearms seized in crime, confirms that smuggled guns comprise a much smaller proportion of recovered illicit firearms in our island nation than they do legally imported firearms, which were subsequently diverted or lost to the black market by lawful owners. Now, since Port Arthur, a range of public health benefits has been both observed and disputed. As policy changes took effect in the wake of the Port Arthur massacre, the risk of an Australian dying by gunshot fell more than 50% and stayed there. Once again, here's 1996, the peak, that's the Port Arthur peak of, of the, Port, uh, the, the spike caused by the Port Arthur shooting, and then that's what happened afterwards. And as you'll see, this is now 2000 and, uh, yes, 2010, uh, and we have no reason to believe that uh, the 2011 figures will show anything, um, uh, any sort of uptick. There's been no uptick detec uh, detected so far. So the number of gun homicides fell from 69 in 1996 to 30 in 2012. Now, once again, as McNorth said, you, you talk about gun crime rising in Australia or, or Great Britain, you have to then look at the size of what that means. Uh, a 10% uptick in, uh, in Britain uh, means not even one death in London. And so it's much the same for Australia. Um, So remember that these indicators were not the primary target of the Australian intervention. Prime Minister John Howard returned from the Port Arthur funerals in the certain knowledge. He was seen to weep, as Obama was seen to weep, at that carnage, and he, he returned with the sure knowledge that he had a mandate to reduce the availability of a single weapon type, and that was the rapid-fire semi-automatic rifles which had been used by the killer. So his declared intention was to reduce the risk of mass killings with that family of firearms. You could say that the effects you've just seen were side benefits. So how about the actual target of the new gun control regime? As Rebecca pointed out, in the decade before the country's change of direction, 100 people had died in 11 mass shootings. Following the 1996 announcement of legislation specifically designed to reduce gun massacres, Australia has seen no more mass shootings. Now, we cannot obviously claim causality. Mass shootings are an extremely rare event. Uh, but what we can say is that, that that result in itself is encouraging. So firearm, of course, firearm-related deaths which attract smaller headlines still occur. Yet the national rate of gun homicide, which before Port Arthur was already one-fifteenth the US rate, and this is not the number, but the rate, um, as compared to a few countries to which the United States would normally uh, be happy to compare itself to, um, Israel, Switzerland to start with, Canada, New Zealand, France, Germany, Australia, United Kingdom, and Japan, 
There's the United States on the left, and Australia is, uh, where, where is, there's Australia. Australia is the red one, of course it is, yes. And by the way, if you want to see any of these data, all you need to go to is go to my website, and every single one of those data points is sourced to the original um, source document, which is usually an official, uh, an official count. So, um, the, already, Australia had uh, a, a gun homicide rate, which was one fifteenth of the US rate. But now that's plunged to 0.13 per 100,000, or 27 times lower than that of the United States. But as in the United States, homicide is not the most common form of gun death in Australia, and that is gun suicide. The most comprehensive impact of the Australian interventions found, and I'll see if I can find it here. Bear with me. No. Could you move on to the next one for me? Thank you. I'm mixing to a website and a PowerPoint here, so I'm just um, running through them. Here we go. So the, uh, the most comprehensive impact study of the Australian interventions found that the buyback led to a drop in the firearm suicide rates of almost 80% with no significant effect on non-firearm death rates. The effect on firearm homicides is of similar magnitude but is less precise. Now, importantly for any discussion of causality, the authors also found that the largest falls The largest falls in firearm deaths occurred in states where most firearms were bought back. Um, that's, uh, that's preliminary and it's very difficult to establish in Australia because we are very short of data, but that's one of our priorities is to, um, is to do a lot more work in that area. So this study went on to cite survey results to suggest that Australia had nearly halved its number of gun-owning households, and then it estimated that by withdrawing firearms on such a large scale, this nation of nearly 23 million people had saved itself 200 deaths by gunshot and $500 million in costs each year. Uh, the evidence is clear that following gun law reform, Australians became many times less likely to be killed with a firearm. But that said, causality and standards of proof are as contentious here as they are in any community which is polarised by the gun debate. And central to the differing interpretations is the fact that Australia's gun death rates were already declining prior to its major public health interventions. Still, taking into, this into account, one study concluded that the rates per 100,000 of total firearm deaths, firearm homicides and firearm suicides all at least doubled their existing rates of decline after the revised gun laws. And next, a, a countervailing study in, interpreted essentially the same empirical findings to conclude the opposite, namely that the gun buyback and restrictive legislative changes had no influence on gun homicide in Australia. In an article for the National Rifle Association of America, one of the co-authors of this study was quoted as saying, the findings were clear, the policy has made no difference. There was a trend of declining deaths which has continued. Now, a third paper relied on different tests to find that Australia's new gun laws did not have any large effects on reducing firearm homicide or suicide rates. I must say that these two little or no effect studies and their methodology have since been heavily criticised. Um, but to date, one important finding has gone uncontested, and that is that in finding no evidence of substitution effect for suicides or homicides, the initial study of impacts showed that Australia's interventions were not followed by displacement from firearms to other methods. So in conclusion, the, the Australian experience, uh, catalyzed as it was by 35 deaths in a single shooting spree, marked a national sea change in attitudes. I can't overemphasize how big the attitudinal change was. You had to be there to see the cartoons. It was not a good time 
to be a gun owner in Australia. And uh, it was, some of it was over the top, um, but it, were, it, it really, it just illustrated the national mood. Um, so the, the thing in Australia was that it, it was led by a conservative government and Australians saw that beliefs and fears aside, death and injury by gunshot could be as, um, as amenable to public health intervention as were the road toll, drink driving, tobacco related disease and curbing the spread of HIV AIDS. The, instruction, the obstructions to firearm injury prevention are absolutely nothing new to public health. An industry and its self-interest groups focused on denial, the propagation of fear and quasi-religious objections. We've seen it all before. But the future is also here to see. With gun violence, as with HIV AIDS, waste of time notions such as evil and blame and retribution can with time be sluiced away to allow long proven public health measures. And given the opportunity and the effort, gun injury prevention can save lives as effectively as restricting access to rocket propelled grenades and explosives or mandating child safe lids on poison bottles. Now I'd like to just uh, for those who might be interested in finding more on uh, what's uh, on going to the citations and so on, this is the website. It's www.gunpolicy.org, and um, uh, under Australia, we have every country in the world in there, plus a whole lot of others. Um, <laughs> countries that aren't countries, sorry, places like Guam and 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 uh, American Samoa and. <laughs> So on, jurisdictions and states like the eight, sta eight states and territories of Australia. So, not quite countries. Um, and if you go to gunpolicy.org and click on full article, there is a tab there. There is every citation, every source for everything that's been said. And uh, good luck. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Philip. Like, like the rest of you, I think I got briefly excited that, that Philip had information about intergalactic gun control efforts, but I guess those will have to, have to wait. Um, so our third speaker today is, uh, pardon me, fourth speaker, is Dr. Antonio Bandera. Um, Dr. Bandera will be speaking about effects of uh, gun control legislation in Brazil. And um, it's an interesting contrast between Australia and the United Kingdom, um, which both had relatively restrictive gun laws even prior to, um, to the changes that were enacted. And uh, the story in Brazil um, might be somewhat different. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Bandera. I'd like to thank the Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Center for Gun Policy and Research for the invitation. Thank you. My country is not only champion in soccer, <laughs> but also in guns homicides. Considering absolute numbers, 94 deaths a day. In 2003, we had 39,000 deaths. We were able to reduce it to 34,000 in five years, saving 5,000 lives. How come we achieved that? The answer is in my paper that I sent to this symposium, and I will resume it for you now. Like here, our gun law was very permissive, unable to control violence. It was made by the military regime. And like here, our Congress was influenced by the Brazilian gun industry lobby. 
that it finances electoral campaigns of many representatives. So former President Cardoso said to us, work with the electorate in order to pressure the Congress. And we did it. First step was to produce reliable data, worldwide and mainly on Brazil. You Americans are good on that. <laughs> and we learned a lot from your academic studies. But we needed Brazilian ones, and we produced them. So we were able to convince people that, for example, most of our guns were Brazilian made, coming from legal to illegal market, mainly sold illegally by legal stores, or they were stolen from good guys' homes. We could prove that guns are good for attacking, not for self-defense. Because usually, the attacker counts on the surprising factor. He is the one who chooses the moment and conditions of the attack. It's not like in the TV. With scientific data like that, we were able to win the public debate because our NRA only has ideological arguments. Analyze, because gun control demands a political strategy. We have chosen carefully our allies, churches, physicians, scholars, sympathetic journalists and politicians, and women. In Latin America, the use of guns is a male problem. The women movement has this symbol. And through a Freudian analysis, <laughs> we mock men who need big and powerful guns to prove their masculinity. Young people loved it. Then we crossed the country debating with the strong support of the media. The most influential media were with us, which is not very common. We spent a lot of time talking with journalists and the owners of big media companies, the Bloomberg's of Brazil. <laughs> Attending UN requests for, to mobilize people and call attention for weapons surplus diverted from government stocks we promoted the biggest public, public gun destruction. Rebecca was there. Destroy 100,000 guns at once. With the help of a popular TV soap opera, promoting the debate on guns use, we mobilized people to march in big cities. You have another public destruction. Here you burned rifles. And here, the last march, we were able to organize in Copacabana Beach with 50,000 people marching for the change in law. After four years effort, a national survey showed that 81% of the population was for gun control. The, the gun lobby had the money, but we had the votes. Then, 
I was for the first time welcomed by Congress, by congressmen. And all political parties voted for our bill, the disarmament statute in 2003. <clears throat> President Lula signed it into law as a Christmas gift to the Brazilians. Coming from the streets to the Congress, the new law is advanced and has inspired law reform in several countries. We also coordinate an international expert team to elaborate a model law, which is an ideal law, a source of inspiration for other countries' reform. Basically, the Brazilian law prohibits the carrying of weapons by civilians, prohibits guns above caliber 38 for civilians, raises a minimum age to buy a gun to 25 years old, and adds 15 requirements to qualifying to buy a gun like evidence of psychological stability, and a knowledge of gun use. A national da database was set up to monitor gun ownership. And ammunition have to be marked to enable tracing. We organized several voluntary weapons buybacks, collecting more than half a million guns. One of them is behind held, is being held now, which slogan is hand in your hand in your weapons, protect your family. We found that only 18% of people handed in their guns for the money in compensation. The main reason is to protect their children from the risk of guns at home. In our publicity, we emphasize this aspect. As a result of less guns in circulation, carrying guns prohibition, and police reform, in Rio and Sao Paulo, among other measures, deaths caused by guns decreased 8% in the last years. The decrease also affects the ceiling of guns. So Brazilian industry Taurus, once limited in the Brazilian market, expanded its export in 370% since 2000. Together with its plant in Florida, it accounts for 20% of pistols and revolvers sold in your domestic market. I'm sorry for that. ATF of officials gave me this information. So gun control works, saves lives. It worked in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Angola, Mozambique, and countries where we have collaborated with. Firearms cross cities, states, and country borders. As you know, we cannot save ourselves alone. International police cooperation and information interchange are usually to be implemented, like the new OAS-1, Observatory on Citizen Security. And we need not only police cooperation, but also civil society international partnership, international mobilization. When people feel that 
is part of an international movement, they feel stronger, more secure. Disarmament is not only a local, de local demand, and good disarmament results in other countries attract people to our, to our cause. Next year, the soccer, world, the soccer World Cup will be held in Brazil, and the show, social theme will be disarmament. Whenever the Brazilians play, they display a banner supporting disarmament, as they did before their game against the United States in Washington two years ago. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, we won the, the game. <laughs> <laughs> in Brazil, we'll be able to hand in guns in exchange for tickets to the match. You, you will be welcome to Rio. <laughs> I already spoke with governments of several Latin American countries, and they are all for gun handing programs during the Cup. If your country join us in this movement, we could have a continental buyback campaign, uniting the sporting spirit of fraternity with a culture of peace and gun control. I believe that United States participation will reinforce your struggle. Good luck with your efforts for gun control in your country. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bandera. Uh, I neglected to mention that his organization, Viva Rio, as you can already see, is one of the most effective gun violence prevention organizations in the world. Well, so uh, now on the program, we have some time for uh, a discussion with the panelists, which I will uh, help to, to moderate. Do we have microphones again this time? We do. Uh, and I'd be foolish not to call on the university president when he raises his hand. And I'd like to think I'm not foolish. So um, here. Well, right, yeah, fair enough. We'll see uh, by the question. <laughs> Uh, two quick questions. Uh, first, uh, to uh, Philip Alpers, uh, in, where there is dispute about how we understand in Australia the effect of the regulatory changes on uh, gun-related injury and death, if it's not about the regulation, what's the, um, what's the story as to what happens and explains the secular decline? So that's, that's one. Sorry, uh, what, what, explains? What, explains, what explains the decline? If it's not regulation, if it's not the regulatory changes, those people who say this was irrelevant and something else was happening, what was the something else that explains that? That's one question. The other question that I have, and I think this cuts across the panel, uh, goes to the issue of um, mass uh, political mobilization around the adoption of this legislation. And, you know, we see that there's some common commonalities across jurisdictions in terms of uh, having uh, political leadership, having um, a horrific public event that, that constitutes a tipping point for public opinion. Um, and we also know that the importance of having a, a, a broad coalition. I'm interested in um, thinking about the construction of that coalition, and in particular, some of the surprising allies who joined you. And here I'm interested in uh, lessons for the United States in terms of some of the uh, organizations that were important and maybe even surprising who helped you move public opinion. And here I'm just interested to what extent you were able to find common cause with um, some segments of industry, with the health profession, with unions, with religious leadership, 
uh, again, just how, how were these coalitions cobbled together and who were important and ultimately um, very potent allies in, in helping you change uh, public opinion and drive the legislative imperative? Well, I'll briefly answer that first question, and that is that uh, there is no something else. Nobody has suggested any, uh, any uh, uh, good reason for the, the, the decline before, uh, apart from the fact that it seemed to be common in, in many Western uh, uh, industrialised nations at the time. In Australia, one thing is very noticeable in the debate, and that is that we do the research and they don't. Um, and <clears throat> there is no, there's nothing coming from the other side that says, look at these figures, we've done this research, this shows that, uh, that the decline was due to this. They don't even try. Um, and so it's a, it's a pretty one-sided debate in, in that way. Um, and no, no, there's been no coherent argument brought up for why, in fact, one of the papers that was so heavily criticised by, um, uh, several people in this room, um, the method that they used suggested, uh, relied on the fact that that downward decline would go down to zero, would continue going and going and going and going. And uh, that was the major flaw in their argument. So there is a, um, uh, yeah, the, there's no, exp no other explanation that we've heard of. R Rebecca, would you like to talk about uh, the process for building the coalition in Australia? Sure. Um, uh, it was, uh, I think, a very broad coalition is important to have. And um, we had a lot of um, public health and medical organizations which, um, which themselves did outreach to other public health and medical organizations. So it's important to have a coalition where the, which, um, re do, which expands itself, which grows organically, I suppose you could say. And, um, uh, I suppose it's, it doesn't seem surprising since it is a, a public health problem, but um, including uh, medical colleges that wouldn't necessarily, you know, the College of Ophthalmologists, um, the various allied health professionals, uh, it, it wasn't just the emergency physicians, um, for example. And uh, that was very, very helpful for us because the public health community and, and medical communities uh, command enormous respect. Uh, throughout the societies. But some of the other um, allies we had were trade unions, especially um, the finance sector union, because people who work in, in, in banks uh, are very, um, they, have a, they have a big problem with uh, PTSD uh, from, from robberies. Also, uh, the, other, the other occupations which are very subject to gun violence, people who work in retail in, and people who work in transport, taxi and, um, and drivers, um, and in, in terms of, we also were supported by, it was interesting, the private sector organizations uh, did not want to be known uh, to be supporting us because there is, you know, when the fight is on to, to have as your uh, opponent a lot of people who s are defined by their ownership of guns and their uh, intense uh, dedication to ownership of guns against all odds. That was quite a frightening uh, uh, experience and a lot of the private sector organizations didn't want to be identified as a result of that. Um, the churches were very important to us and, and I guess I should say that the experience, I mean I was the leader of the global movement against gun violence as well and this experience we've seen in many other countries in Africa and Latin America, uh, the importance of broad coalitions and faith leaders, churches and in, in Africa, the Islamic organizations as well um, have been very important because they're great carriers of messages and mobilizers of people. And it's in different countries, churches play a different role. I mean, Antonio might want to say something about the fact that the, the, the evangelical churches in Brazil have been very important part of the campaign, uh, whereas in, um, in some countries, different types of churches might take different positions. Uh, but obviously the women's groups, anything to do with kids and youth, uh, and, and legal organizations, a broad coalition was is really important. Do Dr. Bandera, and police. I forgot to mention police. <laughs> Dr. Bandera, do you want to add anything about the about the faith coalition in Brazil? 
Yeah, the main ally were church, all, all kind of church, which has a strong influence and is a co has a commitment with peace, uh, peaceful <laughs> methods of solving conflicts. And women, women were very important. Uh, uh, we had a mother's campaign to convince their son to 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 hand in their guns, and uh, many actresses from the soap uh, uh, TV were very important because they influence youth. Uh, their idols, so they are artists and uh, sportsmen. Sports and uh, celebrities, 99% uh, of them were in favor of disarmament. The other side didn't have nothing to present. So that's very important because in Latin America, I think here is the same case, uh, the victims and the authors of homicides are young people. And it's not easy to convince young people to hand in their guns. Much easier to convince old people, but not young people. So uh, uh, that worked very well. And the physicians were very important. When a sociologist like me speaks, well, the effect is very small, but when a physician who in, at the hospital is every day trying to save lives uh, that make a lot of uh, effect in terms of uh, auto moral authority, professional authority. So uh, that's why I emphasize importance to mobilize all these sectors. Groups that are uh, uh, faced with with violence, like uh, uh, NGOs work for black uh, people rights, uh, sexual minorities, uh, they were also mobilized. So if you add all this, is a real, uh, a real a very big from uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, social force. Mm. And that made the difference. And uh, we were able to convince people. Thank you. Hi, thank you. N another, another question? Yes, sir. Uh, Steve Albrand, private citizen. Um, I've got a question for Dr. Mandero in regard to Brazil. And first of all, commendations for the action taken in Brazil on this topic. But I've got some troubling numbers, and I, I wonder if you could help me interpret them. The numbers say that while there's something like 90 guns, or not, for every 100 people in, in the United States, there's 90 guns. In Brazil, it's like 8.8, one-tenth the number of guns in existence. But then when I look at the violent crime, the homicides committed with guns, I find in Brazil, there seems to be a lot more homicides being done with the guns that do exist. Is that credible? Is there some cultural or some reason for that that uh, we should understand? Well, I don't know if I understood well, but if I, I, I didn't, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, the reduction of guns in Australia was 50%. In Brazil, only 8%. Uh, that's why the Australian police is a good police. In Brazil, and usually in Latin America, a huge part of the police is more part of the problem than of the solution. They sell guns to orga organize crime. Uh, we has an uh, in a written from military regime, a very corrupt and violent police. So that's why my NGO will work not only for gun control, but also for police reform. 
And the last years, police reform was implemented in Sao Paulo and Rio, the big cities. And the decrease in homicides in Sao Paulo in the last 10 years was <coughs> gun homicides, 70%. And in Rio, 30%. Why? Because we start to control police, né, to train better police. And uh, at the same time, in the north of the country, in the Amazon region, uh, homicides uh, increased 80% <laughs> in the last four years. So you, uh, gun control is part of the solution. Uh, it's not uh, the solution. Mainly in Brazil and in Africa. I have been working in Angola, Mozambique. They have the same problem. Uh, uh, gun control is very important, is essential, but you must uh, change the public security because uh, they real uh, are very connected with organized crime. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question? Jan, could I just speak to that briefly? Certainly. Um, from a, a, another side of the planet, uh, I did uh, some research in Papua New Guinea and uh, working in the Southern Highlands, which is a tinderbox uh, province. And there they've moved from bows and arrows to assault weapons in the last 15 years, 20 years. And the mortality rate from guns was, when I was up there, just horrific. And so I spent time tracing the guns, finding out where they came from, speaking to the people who used them. And remarkably, men love talking about their guns. Um, and so I, found, I got very, very candid responses, uh, especially from the, the hire men, or the, the Rambos, as they call themselves, uh, who are the mercenaries, usually from um, uh, ex-military, who hire themselves out to tribes and give the tribe some power uh, with a single gun. Now, there we found that the risk, the actual, the, the guns are very rare, and yet they're used, uh, they're used, they're, the motivation is quite different. They don't buy their guns to shoot possums, they buy their guns to shoot each other. And so, even though a gun might be the most expensive thing that a tribe owns, that a clan owns, or they, they're spending almost all their money hiring a, a Rambo to come and, and beat up the tribe in the next valley, the, the, the risk of that firearm being used for a homicide the next year is, uh, was, we calculated, about twice what it is in Ecuador, which at the time had the highest risk. So motivation has to be taken into account. And uh, on that same uh, point that you made, Antonio, the, of course, the most common, we asked everybody, why do you have a gun? Oh, it's for self-defense. Um, who do you have to defend yourselves against? Other tribes and the police. Oh, you, the police, you have to defend, your, well, yes, they're another tribe. And so until you have justice and law reform, until you have uh, police that you can trust, until you have all sorts of poverty alleviation and so on, you're not going to solve the problem for good. But um, yeah, I, I hope that answers some of your question. Thanks. Question over there? Good morning. My name is Dana Moore. I'm an attorney here in Baltimore. And first of all, thank you for, for being here. This has been very in, informative. Uh, my husband, Ralph, asked me to mention that today is Martin Luther King's birthday. So it's very significant that we are here. <laughs> um, Dr. North, I'm so glad to hear you. You um, very elegantly refute a lot of what's said after Newtown that we will soon forget, um, the loss of life and of children. And you put a very fine point to that, that it does not, we do not forget, it does not go away. One of the responses that is happening here after Newtown is to put more guns into schools. The NRA says the answer is to arm the teachers and the principals and to put more guns in schools. I don't agree with that. I don't imagine too many people do. But, but teachers, some, are responding to that and are taking training and are learning how to uh, shoot, you know, to carry and shoot. How do we respond to that? How do we turn that back? This is not the answer, but how do we stop that and change that thinking? I, 
I think it's very, very difficult because one of the things that happens is that certain organisations simply use the opportunity to fuel fear. And uh, dare I say, uh, it, it, you know, do go out to seek an increase uh, uh, sales. Um, it has to be a collective effort. Uh, I don't suppose anybody here wants to see a school turned into a fortress. The idea that school kids are exposed to guns from whatever age, three, four, five, is appalling. I hear people complain about video games <laughs> and being exposed to violence in video games. What happens if every day you go to school, you have to go past armed guards? And how many guards do you need? Um, that's not providing an answer. There were in Britain some people who raised this, said our children wouldn't have been killed if there had been an armed guard. But I would have hated the idea that my daughter went to a school with an armed guard at any time. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Dr. Greenberg, did you want to respond to that possibly? No, um, just another question. Oh, that's fine too. Uh, I'm Sheldon Greenberg with Johns Hopkins. In Australia, you stated that people had to justify the reason to keep their weapons. What is the civil or criminal consequence if they uh, lie? Um, um, if uh, loss of license um, is the main thing. I mean, the main thing we're trying to do is is stop people from having guns who shouldn't have them. Um, and so um, the, uh, but it's, it's, it's much, it's more, well, you can lie, but it's difficult, it's harder to get away with lying if you have to, uh, have to prove it. Um, um, I think there are consequences for lying on the form, but the main thing is you won't get the, you won't get the license, <laughs> um, which is, we're more concerned about prevention, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, sir. Oh, uh, well, looks like maybe we'll get the microphone to you. You'll get the next question, sir. Um, yes? Also, could I say that if your circumstances change, so sometimes, for example, uh, people say they want a gun because they're a member of a target shooting club. The target shooting club has to, this is the, um, in particular in relation to handguns, the target shooting club has to uh, vouch for you, and they are required to record that you attend regularly at the club. If you don't attend, I can't remember the number, whether it's four times a year or something like that, then you no longer have a good reason to have a handgun and your, uh, your license will be cancelled and you have to dispose of that weapon. So um, if your reason changes, if your reason was occupational or if your reason was um, hunting and you move to a different part of the country or something, if you re and, and it's very important to say that the licenses are up for, they're renewed every uh, in different jurisdictions between one year and five years. And so if you're... Um, if your license, if your reason no longer applies, then you no longer qualify. Does enforcement fall to the police? Or in other words, the, the, it's the, the enforcement is up to the police, but you don't hear about, um, you know, we, we haven't had police kicking down the door anywhere, seizing people's guns. Um, um, it's, uh, yeah, enforcement falls to the police. Yes, sir. I think Dr. Uh, Bandera, uh, brought up a good point when he said guns are good for the attacker and not for the defender. When we look at saying let's arm those people in schools to protect our children, there is unless you literally have somebody in every room able to shoot instantaneously and make that decision, uh, you're not you're you're not going to be successful because the as he said. Attackers have the choice of time and therefore the element of surprise. They're and we've got to there. remember that, and that's one of the things that maybe we really, on this side, need to really push and say, yeah. really, what does that do? Yeah, I mean, there are also um, anecdotal, terrible anecdotal stories of police who are obviously extremely well trained uh, to, um, to use the gun, fire it, know when to shoot, and in, uh, in some very stressful um, circumstances where 
uh, things are moving quickly, the, the police aren't able to, um, to ultimately shoot the attacker and wind up shooting innocent bystanders as well. Dr. North, did you want to add to that? From the experience of Dunblane, when my daughter was killed, there were three teachers in the gym, uh, and uh, but the gunman came in with the gun already pointing, and he targeted them first. Uh, the, uh, it's right, they know what they're doing, the defenders don't. Um, so the thing is to take the gun away from the man who attacks. Thank you. Yes, sir? Yes, thank you. Uh, Eric Dressel, class of 84, uh, alumni, uh, Homewood. Um, I was here yesterday, really appreciated the, the uh, presentations, the research, just so well done. And I think uh, very convincing that some steps need to be taken that are reasonable and, and well thought out. I feel a little more like troubled today because in a sense, I'm, I'm asking just in the general sense, you know, does evil exist? And yes, it does. And yet, I see a, a sign for a world without weapons, drugs, violence, and racism. And that's, that's very optimistic, I, I understand. And yet, as Mr. Alper said, with the New Guinea tribe, I believe it was, um, that prior to guns, they were shooting each other with bows and arrows. And so I look at a, the, a last century where our parents or grandparents uh, experienced a uh, hundred million or so deaths at the hands of, of totalitarian secular regimes. And I say, you know, that's, that's a lot of deaths. And uh, bad people exist in the world. And as Lord Acton said, uh, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so the Second Amendment in this country wasn't so much about defense from home invasion, but to uh, assure that there would never be a totalitarian regime uh, that would put us as citizens of the US under its thumb. You certainly look at a world uh, and, and history and say uh, there's good cause to be concerned about the tendencies of people in power. What I'm getting to is that uh, we, I get nervous, I, I love the research, and I love the reasonable discussion. I feel a little nervous when, I, when people on a theoretical basis and, and academics uh, tend to generalize these optimistic humanistic uh, scenarios where there's just gonna be an end all evil when we put away the guns. I'm sorry, but good people with force are the only thing that stops a lot of evil from taking over in this world. So, so and so do the you point have a is, is that our question, goal to get sir? rid of all guns. We saw with Hurricane Sandy. Sir, sir do, you have a, do you have a question that I can uh, I, ask I'd you like to, to get to? I'd like to put forth my preposition, for, proposition first and then ask for a response. If I could just finish. I, I mentioned the regime's concept, that that is why many Americans want to own guns. Secondly, we saw with Hurricane Sandy when there's a, even a very temporary lack of control through a breakdown of infrastructure, there's roving bands of criminals terrorizing people, waltzing into their houses. And I'm sorry, but police can't respond to everything. So many other people are concerned about a terrorist attack, some sort of something with the infrastructure. And many people that make these policies, my friends, you live in gated communities with protection, and you don't worry about a neighbor. Sir, sir we, we really do have limited time here for question and answer. So if, if you have a question for the panel, could you ask it now or otherwise hand the microphone over, please? OK. Uh, Is maybe, it your maybe, ultimate maybe goal we'll, to maybe, make sir, the United sir. States gun free? No. Oh, don't think that. That's not why um, I'm here. I think sucks. So, I, I don't. I don't believe that. I don't believe that has been the the policy that we've been talking about over the last few days. I don't believe that the Second Amendment, as uh, um, Professor Winkler will be talking about later today, uh, endorses that that approach. And so perhaps Dr. Winkler will address some uh, some of your additional comments later. Uh, other questions? Yes, ma'am. So I think a big theme of the conference has been that we can achieve gun control within the realm of the Second Amendment. And um, I was wondering if any uh, of the panelists here have um, similar rules from your country where that protects owning guns on, on the same level as all of our other fundamental rights. 
There are, um, there are fewer than a handful of countries in the world who have a, an equivalent of the Second Amendment as strong as and as absolute and as, as, uh, as <coughs> clear as the Second Amendment. So um, none of our countries have anything remotely close to that. Some countries in Latin America do have it in their constitution. Um, but I think it's pretty clear from the work that's been done um, here that, the, um, that it's possible to have good laws um, still within the, with, within the bounds of the Second Amendment. Yeah, so we'll hear from Professor Winkler w without wanting to anticipate him too much uh, other than um, banning handguns. The Supreme Court has said that there's an awful lot of reasonable regulation that's, that's still permissible. Other questions? Uh, uh, just a, a point. In Brazil, the Supreme Court decided that the basic right to be defended by the state is life. And that all serious research all over the world shows that uh, guns at home is more a risk than a protection. Thank you. The next question. Yes, thank you, Matt. I'm Carrie Frisch from Johns Hopkins. And um, this is sort of piggybacking on the question about um, a short memory for events. And um, we have looming um, congressional debates that are going to be happening in this country, you know, fiscal cliff, debt ceiling, government shutdown. And I'm wondering whether you can offer us advice on how to keep the issue alive in the public consciousness as we get diverted with some of these other issues, uh, very important issues um, and debates nationally, whether your country's held rallies or you talked a little bit about petitions. We have you know, internet peti petitions going on now, but if you could speak to that um, more public-wide mobilization effort to keep, um, to keep a movement alive. We didn't start out with a clear strategy. I'm not quite sure that there was a strategy as things, things went, uh, uh, went along. But I, I think part of it is the willingness of those most involved to be involved in particular with the media and, uh, and lobbying politicians. And perhaps not give up until something happens. It, speaking personally, it put a lot of emotional strain on me and my friends in Dunblane, um, but we were prepared to do that. Um, it's hard for me to stand back and think how much effort as a concerned citizen I would have put in, but it depends on, on the whole of the population keeping the, uh, uh, the issue alive. I think that the survivors of gun violence, people who've lost loved ones or themselves have been shot, have an important role to play in keeping the, uh, the issue in the, in the public eye, but more in the, on the agenda for policy makers. But also, um, the, in terms of the, what affecting the agenda, that's, this is also where the, the, um, dis, the unequal allocation of money that's around comes into play because there is obviously the, the, the side of the argument that wants to oppose uh, reforms in the law is well funded and more monolithic than the side that is pressing for uh, reform. And um, I think that the, and we've heard a bit about the, 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 the difficulties caused by cutting off of research funding and likewise the funding that's available for um, advocacy is extremely limited. So I, I, I think that, that um, finding the resources is a big challenge, but also that, the, that survivors have an important role to play. And research also that, that, the, that as new information comes out that that's important in keeping the issue on the table. Other, other comments from the, from the panelists? Okay, uh, 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 let's see if we can find a microphone for you. You wanna stand and, stand and yell? Okay. Um, so one of the, the points that I think will be used in discussion in this country is that there's actually a great deal of commonality of opinion, <coughs> excuse me, across the lines of gun ownership on much of what should be done. Uh, we hear 
today and at other times vocally from a minority of gun owners mm. who see this in absolute terms. Uh, but for the majority, I think, um, there's more agreement than disagreement. And I wonder if in your countries you found that one of your surprising coalition partners was the, um, the great mass of people who have firearms themselves. Yeah, we, in Australia, we, um, the survey showed that um, most uh, gun owners um, understood and supported the, the changes. And we had, um, they weren't members of our coalition, but we had support, they, they came out publicly and supported the laws, was um, a group, there's a group in Australia called the Professional Shooters Association, which is basically the original crocodile dundees, these guys who are like <laughs> tougher than anything, and they're, they, you know, they've got giant muscles and tattoos and, um, bronzed Aussie uh, caricatures, and they um, uh, particularly they shoot animals to they control feral animals in the national parks. They work for the government. So they're called the Professional Shooters Association, and they came out and said in support of the laws and said anyone who needs a semi-automatic to hit an animal is a city boy who shouldn't be out here with a gun <laughs> in the first place. Um, and that was important to, 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 to have that. And also our, um, the year of the reforms was 1996 and Australia did well in the, Atlantic, uh, the Atlanta Olympics in the shooting. And the, um, the Olympic shooters also were, they, you know, when they went to hand in the semi-automatic rifles that they had, which they had won as prizes, they're not used in Olympic events. Um, they handed them in and um, there was a lot of media publicity around that. And we did hear from individual gun owners writing letters to the editor and, and things like that. So it, it was very, very important. I think in, in Britain, uh, we didn't get any support from gun owners, but there was perhaps a silent majority, people who weren't prepared to go out and join modestly attended rallies and who didn't agree. But I think they, 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 were, they, they were frightened of, of speaking out. But uh, there, although there was a quite dogmatic um, opposition to what we wanted in Britain. It wasn't uh, nearly as vocal as perhaps we'd anticipated. Uh, so I think the majority of gun owners just decided that they weren't going to say anything and perhaps did agree that particularly the, uh, the um, high caliber weapon uh, handgun shooting was just not something they wanted to be associated with. Thank, thank also, you. Um, oh, yes, go ahead. So during the buyback that I was talking about, uh, looking back at the press clippings from all of those days, it's very clear that reporters went and interviewed the queues, went up and down the queues waiting to have their guns uh, handed over and got all a variety of views. This is dreadful that I'm having to hand this over. This is my grandfather's gun, etc. But in there was a very large number of people saying, I've got no objection to this, I think it's a really good idea. And I'm, I've been a shooter for years, but I just don't need this, this firearm, um, and it's, it's got my backing. So that, was, uh, that opinion was very common and, uh, and um, very, uh, very noticeable during that time. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um this kind of falls in the same vein as some of what you just said, so maybe you can build on it a little bit more, but it seems like the buyback programs were so essential to the reductions in the shootings that you saw after the change in gun laws, and with 300 million guns here, it seems to me that it would also be essential, or if not essential, it would be extremely helpful <laughs> in decreasing gun violence in the U.S., but I, I don't think, it's not my impression, that we have the same kind of support among um, gun owners that you're describing that you had. Um, and it seems also that was not doing any sort of buyback plan was um, one of the big obstacles to the 94 assault weapons ban um, effectiveness. So I guess you've also described a certain tipping point in public opinion that happened after the mass shootings in, in Great Britain and Australia, and I think even in, in the wake of Sandy Hook and all our other sh mass shootings here, I don't know if we've quite gotten there yet um, in terms of being 
that the idea that the rights of people to own these guns sh um, should be pale in comparison to the rights of or the public safety concerns of having them. So I guess I just want to hear more of the lessons we could learn from your experience in convincing gun owners and politicians that you know the buyback or getting rid of the ag existing guns was so essential. And I guess in, especially in light of the Second Amendment that we have here. Um, I don't think anybody expects that the U.S. would adopt the same gun laws as, um, um, say, Britain or Australia. But um, the 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 notion that a gun law package of gun laws should be comprehensive should 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 not just rely on one measure uh, is something that I think is applicable to this country. And um, and some of the more glaring um, gaps in the gun laws here could be addressed with the, the basic measures that apply in other countries. I mean, for example, if there's a, an assumption that a person should undergo a criminal background check before being able to have a gun, then that, uh, that should apply to all, to, to all gun sales. Um, and, and also that uh, recognizing that the, uh, that people who, that it's not only people who've been convicted of major crimes that should be um, screened out, but, but that the standard should be, that the, that the screening should cut in um, uh, earlier than that. Um, and I suppose the, uh, and, and also recognizing that in America, I don't know if America will ever be able to have uniform gun laws, but there's a lot of, uh, but state by state, there's capacity for improvements. And um, uh, so I think that there are a lot of things that can be done in the U.S. I'd, I'd like to, to take the moderator's prerogative and ask this the very last question. And, and I'd like to ask each of you to just very, very briefly, if, if there was one piece of advice, one piece of advice um, for the U.S. going forward, what, what would you leave us with? Dr. North? I think it is that all of you who are concerned and, and want to do something about reducing gun violence, maintain energy and just keep going. Um, to uh, pinpoint a specific thing would be rather difficult, I think, and probably not appropriate for someone coming from overseas. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose to... to um, not to you know America is uh, um, the richest country in many ways the greatest country in the world um, it people should have um, people are entitled to a much higher level of degree of safety than than you have so just to keep in mind it's not um, the whatever American um, uh, the very special nature of America shouldn't mean that uh, Americans are less safe than people in, in other comparable countries. Thank you. Philip? I find it impossible to whittle it down to one. I'd say background checks and take the muzzle off researchers. Maybe I'm more uh, optimistic, but uh, I think uh, something that we have, uh, it's hard to understand in the United States that is this debate that polarizes on one side good guys against bad guys, good guns against bad guns. That's very simplistic because in almost all countries, most of gun homicides has nothing to do with bad guys, with organized crime, but has to do with interpersonal conflict. Is men killing women? Is accident with children? Is neighborhood uh, uh, fight, soccer fight, nightclubs, suicide? If in Brazil, if you put all this together, it's more than 80% of homicides. So one of the effects of uh, buyback voluntary campaign is that less guns in the hands of good guys to protect their families. So it's very simplistic to 
polarize only good guys against bad guys. Legal guns with good guys kill much more than the crazy people. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the panel. Uh, the panel that's come so far and, uh, and shared their, um, their experiences with us. We now have a 15-minute break. It's 11.05, so we will reconvene at 11.20.